Let me just take a moment to introduce Rosie. Why don't you come and uh, stand a little bit closer for a moment? Uh, Rosie is one of our student ministers. Where do you come from, Rosie? Uh, I'm from Brisbane. Uh, and why are you here? <laughs> uh, I'm currently in my first year at Moore College. So why did you come to Moore College? Um, I want to have good foundations for a lifetime of ministry. Uh, I, I want to be clear on what God says in his word and I want to know him better and to have the privilege of spending all my time doing that. Um, I jumped at the opportunity of that. So that's what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Good, good, good. And uh, how's first year going? Yeah, it's going well. Uh, we're on the brink of exams, so I'm feeling all right. <laughs> yeah, the next week will be worse. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Found me at a good time. Good. Rosie's going to sit there and read the Bible for us. She is the uh, the voice of God, so to speak. Because <laughs> uh, we're not having a Bible reading. We're having a whole battery of Bible readings on the way through. Because they're fairly quick and uh, short, I'll get her to be reading them, and we'll be putting them up on the screen. Uh, although towards the end, you will need to open up your Bibles uh, as we look at one passage towards the end. But more of that in a moment. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray be with us now. Help us to think and concentrate clearly. There be clarity of speech. You give us all clarity of mind, Father, that we might know and understand you and your ways in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God save King Charles. Long live King Charles. God save the king, may he live forever. So the crowd called out in the cathedral a couple of weeks ago, long live the king. Just as 3,000 years ago as Zadok, the priest anointed Solomon, all the, pride, all the people cried out, long live King Solomon. Earlier in the day, the people had cried out, long live King Adonijah. What does it mean when you start saying long live the king? Is it any more than a kind of a goodwill wish? You know, may you have a happy life. May you have a long life. If so, why is it that we keep on saying it to kings and queens in particular? Well, we say it to the king. When we do, what we actually mean is we want you to continue to reign over us. We want to trust you with all power and authority as king forever. We want you to keep being king, keep ruling. We want your government. In, in that sense, it's the opposite of democracy. The democracy, when we put anybody in power, says we want your power to be as limited as possible until the next election when we aim to take it from you. <laughs> That's if you haven't been stabbed in the back by your party beforehand. Australia is an uh, equal opportunity nation. Everybody has a chance of being Prime Minister the way we rotate them. <laughs> but let me ask you, whom, whom do you wish to have power over you, authority over you, right over you, to have the wealth that there's? Who do you want to have rule over your life? And who would you want to have rule over your life forever? You see, we may call out, long live the king. That's a custom, a royal ritual, but it's one that I don't think anybody really believes in. It's not simply a meaningless royal ritual. It comes from that very dangerous moment of time, the transfer of power that occurs when the king dies and when a new king arrives. That transfer of power moment is one of the most significant and dangerous moments in the life of any nation. When one government falls and another is placed in its place, that's the danger moment. So when King David died, there was the power grab by Adonijah. And if David hadn't made it clear that Solomon was to reign, then there was every chance that a civil war would have broken out in Israel. And civil wars, revolutions, frequently break out at the moment of the change of government, with the death of a king, with the assassination of a president. That's when danger is at its greatest. Civil wars, of course, devastate a nation. They're the worst of all wars. And revolutions rarely ever improve things. And it's always we little people who get hurt. 
in the civil wars and in the revolutions. But don't imagine that this is just a problem for monarchy. And democracy, republicanism, whatever, it's all the same. See, the popularist, charismatic politician often leaves office with great tumult and instability. Think of Donald Trump. There in those Capitol Hill riots, it was the point of the transfer of power, wasn't it? Or think of Gough Whitlam and the sacking in 1975 here in Australia. It was the point of the transfer of power. Or Imran Khan in, in Pakistan at the moment, who seems to be in jail, out of jail, in jail, because of the transfer of power. Democracy, like any other form of government, democracy is riddled with its problems, just like monarchy is. It's, there's no solution structurally to the problems of humanity. Democracy has the tyranny of the majority, has the corruption of wealth and media. There's the very famous quote, which I'm sure we love, from Winston Churchill. Many forms of government have been tried and will be tried in this world of sin and woe. No one pretends that democracy is perfect or all wise, indeed. It's been said that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. <laughs> Interesting quote there in the sense of, notice the Christian way of at least speaking, if not thinking. He speaks, as Peter has spoken for us in this last time, this last session here, about this world of sin and woe. Because that's the context in which we run government. It's, it's not utopia, it's sin and woe. Uh, by the way, uh, monarchy and democracy are put against each other, but really they, they combine as well. It's, they're not absolutely opposites. Uh, British democracy somehow includes monarchy, and British monarchy somehow includes democracy. The Houses of Parliament are the very home of democracy. And yet, there is the king we've seen in the coronation. So how does it all fit together? I'm not talking today, and I'm very sorry to disappoint anybody, but I'm not talking about monarchy versus republicanism and, uh, and that whole debate of what I should, where Australia should be. What I'm talking about is the king's birthday. We're talking about the government form called monarchy. That's the one that was seen a couple of weeks ago in King Charles's coronation. So let's go back and try to gain some understanding of what is this monarchy. And the cry, long live the king, what does it mean really for us? See, the word monarchy refers to the rule of a king or a queen. It's derived from the Greek word, which, or Greek words, which means the rule of one, one person in charge. That, that's what monarchy is about, the monarch, the one, the, the mon, Mono, one, archi, rule, the one ruler. And so we start with the absolute monarchy, which is about as old as recorded history. Whether you call it a king or a queen or a chief or a ruler, a lord, a czar, a, a kaiser, a potentate, an owner, an emperor, <laughs> they're just words, but they're really referring to the single ruler, the one who actually is in charge of all the rule of one. The absolute monarch rules by, well, by power, be it economic power, be it militaristic power, be it a combination of those. His power was absolute in that he could do whatever he wanted to do and could get away with. He made the rules that pleased himself. And he kept the rules that pleased himself. For his laws may apply to other people, but they don't necessarily apply to himself. It's a simple form of government, really. It's still alive around the world. There are all kinds of absolute monarchs in the world today, in the 160 or so countries that we have, to say nothing of the effective monarchs in all kinds of modern dictatorships. Now, the key problem to the principle of absolute monarchy, I mean, the key problem to absolute monarchy is the monarchs, they're the problem, but the key to the principle of setting up government as the rule of one, the key problem really lies in death. Who rules when the king dies? There's a couple of 
options. You have a power struggle and a revolution and a war. That's one option. The other option is you have an agreed succession plan, usually kind of an inheritance of the oldest son or something like that. But of course, sometimes those two plans go together where you have a civil war in the royal family. I mean, to think of the absolute monarch, you think of North Korea, where one family has now ruled for three generations, chosen manifestly not for their ability, but for their family connections. And there are all kinds of troubles inside the royal family with all kinds of members disappearing. The ancient world was full of absolute monarchs. It's the most obvious, simple form of government that was set up, you see. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, they're all absolute monarchs. And they all have the same kind of signs about them. They can see in the rulers who are trained, if not dressed up anyway, in military apparel. They exhibit great wealth wherever they can. They gather great crowds to bring praise and honour to them. And since the 20th century, they've gathered together media people to make them look good. But what they require from the populace is obedience from people whom they call their subjects. Here's the wedding photo of King of Thailand. We see. Uh, you, you see, his bride actually did crawl on the ground to him, as you'll see some of the other attendants lying prostrate on the ground before this absolute monarch. Here's a couple more photos of him accepting some royal consort into his harem. He has a large harem. You'll notice his wife sits there watching as another woman prostrates herself in order to join in under his authority. Military uniform, power, wealth, wives, concubines, harems. One other element to bring into this brief overview of absolute monarchy is the frequent use of religion to bolster power and to give the perception of legitimacy. I think Peter's definition of government was to rule the right of the rule by right of authority. There's that sense of legitimacy. And it comes from the gods or the god. Or it can be that the king, the Roman emperor was very good at this, the pharaoh, became godlike himself to be worshipped and feared as a god, not just as a man. But it's more simple in, say, medieval Europe that the claim was that God had chosen and appointed the king to rule with all kinds of divine rights. However, there's an alternative to absolute monarchy, that is, constitutional monarchy, where the king is not above the law, but under the law, especially under God and God's law. It's where he's not free to do as he wishes, but rather is bound by the law of the land, the law of God. This new way of ruling, this innovation, we see when God gave the law about kings in Deuteronomy chapter 17, and Rosie's going to read to us from verse 14. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as a king over you. See, they will want a king like all the other nations want a king. We can't beat the Philistines unless we have a king. And so they'll set a king over themselves. But God warns this king is not to be a king like the other nations. This king will be the king of God's choice, not theirs. And there are things he mustn't do and there are things he must do. And so we read further in Deuteronomy, the law that sets out what the king mustn't do, what the king must do. Rosie, start off with the ones he mustn't do. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother, only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. Not a foreigner, not many horses, 
Not many wives, not, many, not much excessive silver and gold. These are the things that rulers are always acquiring. And you'll notice throughout it, it's for himself, for himself, for himself. That's what he's doing. Horses, wives, wealth for himself. But also notice the positive instructions of what he is to do, because this is even more extraordinary than that kind of condemnation of absolute rulers. The couple of positive things also, Rosie. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law, approved by the Levitical priests, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it in all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord, his God, by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers and that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. Extraordinary. He is to have a copy of the law. He's to write the copy of the law. He's to keep the copy of the law with him all his life. He's to read the copy of the law. He's to keep the law. He's to do the law. The law will stop him, you see, from being lifted above, above his brothers. He is not to think of himself as more highly than he ought because he is only one of the Israelites and he's not to turn away from God's law. So he's to be under the law at every level. The law is the administration. Jesus was born of a woman. Jesus was born under the law. Being under the law is an extraordinary place for the man who was God. But yet the king was to be under the law, always to have it. This is the king being placed under the law. It's a radically different way to be a king. And it marked Israel out as different to all the other nations of the world. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 4, there's a very important passage. It indicates that when Israel kept the law, when Israel was obedient to the law, then all the nations of the world would gain blessing and benefit because of it. Read for us, please, verse 6 following. That will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sights of the people, who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what, what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? whenever we call upon him. And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? When the people obey the law of God, the nations will be able to say, truly, that is a nation that has the right laws. The nations will be educated in righteousness by Israel keeping the law. However, to understand this biblical innovation of constitutional monarchy, of the king under the law, we need to return back to see the Bible's view of king. For the Bible starts with God as king. Not only as king, but as the absolute monarch of the universe. For there's only one God, there's only one ruler of all. He created all things, he owns all things, he determines what is good and evil. He gives life and he takes life and he can do whatever he likes. Rosie, look over that verse for us from Revelation. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. Because he is the creator of all, he is the owner of all. And therefore he deserves all glory, all honour, all power. Both Old and New Testaments testify to God as the one ruler. Melchizedek and Abram both called him God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. While Jesus and the Apostle Paul both called him Lord of heaven and earth. Well, listen to God's own declaration in Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. And in the next chapter of Isaiah, God speaks to, to a pagan. He speaks to Cyrus, the pagan Persian king, who didn't know him, but God was using him to bring about his purposes. And he said in Isaiah 45, I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. 
I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. All things create calamity as well as well-being. God is the sovereign ruler of everything, including the pagan king who didn't know him. All authority in heaven and earth is derived from God. No human king, ruler, boss, overlord, teacher comes to any power except by the appointment of God. However, there are always these two problems with human kings. The first is what we call sin. That is the rejection of God as our king and the appointment of ourselves as king. The first human monarchist in the Bible is a man called Adam. He wants to be king who determines what is good and evil. He doesn't want to submit to God's law. He refuses to do so, but rather makes the law himself to suit himself. And so, down the history, when it comes to the appointment of Israel's king, Samuel the prophet, the priest, the judge, who was being, in a sense, rejected for the sake of having a king, he warned the people what the king would be like. He said that when you have a king, he will take. He will take your sons, he will take your daughters, he will take your best of your fields, he'll take a tenth of your grain, he'll take your male servants and female servants, he will take a tenth of your flocks, Ultimately, you shall be his slaves. That's what happens when you appoint a king in Israel. Given the normal sinfulness of rulers, what can we do but pray? And so the psalmist prays in Psalm 72. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. When we have a king, we've got to pray. First importance, says Paul in 1 in, in Timothy 3, there isn't it? Pray. This is what we're going to pray. We've got to pray for the king to have that which by nature he won't have, justice and righteousness. The second problem, though, of the human king is death. Even if God answers our prayers and gives us a king who is just and righteous, he's still going to die. So Psalm 146 has this warning. Put your, not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. How sad it is for those who have put their confidence in the president, the king, the prime minister. They all die on us. Even the one that you thought really was going to bring in utopia. You were always wrong and his death proves it to you. The psalmist encourages us not to trust kings, but to trust the Lord God who made heaven and earth, who keeps faith and judges justly, and who is able to call, keep all our needs because he will never die. The Lord will give us protection that our earthly kings always fail us in. The Lord doesn't die as the princes of this world do. And so that Psalm 146 concludes, the Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations, praise the Lord. The temptation to trust our politicians, to our rulers, our kings, our monarchs, etc., which so drives the angst of our modern media, written by journalists who are themselves frustrated politicians, puts the, uh, the hope and aspiration in government in a place that is totally unbecoming because we are people of sin and mortality. We will never get the government we deserve, let alone the one we want. It's in the failure of Saul, the first king of Israel, that we meet the greatest model king of the Old Testament, King David. And with King David, we find the promised hope and the disappointing reality of Israel's kings. For God promised David's house will always reign. He will reign forever. But King David was a failure. He was a sinner who died. 
sinning not just in the affair with Bathsheba, but in his whole polygamous family and the bloodshed on his hands. He died in his old age. And Solomon, his son, the next king, who started so brilliantly, but who finished so poorly, corrupted by his many wives, foreign wives. And then we get the long record of kings basically failing everything that God required of them. From, uh, from Jeroboam and Rehoboam and their splits to, to Hoshea in the northern kingdom and, and Zedekiah in the southern kingdom. The one destroyed by the Assyrians, the other by the Babylonians. The story from Solomon onwards is just a long, slow grind down. Listen to how Psalm 89 speaks of both the promise and the disappointment for the almighty and righteous God has sworn by his holiness never to lie to David. And he says, His offspring shall endure forever, his throne as long as the sun before me. Like the moon, it shall be established forever, a faithful witness in the skies. There's the promise, you see. But the reason that he, the psalmist tells us of the promise again, that great detail, not just that couple of verses, the reason was so that we could feel the weight of the disappointment but now you have cast off and rejected. You are full of wrath and against your anointed. You have renounced the covenant with your servant. You have defiled his crown in the dust. David will rule forever. And the people are now living in Babylon, in slavery. There's the disappointing reality, the Babylonian captivity. And yet, in the very depth of the Babylonian captivity, when we could not sing the songs of Zion, in the depth of that, God renewed his promise. Speaking through the prophet Ezekiel and the day of resurrection, remember the valley of dry bones, Ezekiel 37, when God would raise up and reunite the nation, north and south together, and there would be one king, David, over all the people, the regenerated people of the kingdom of God. But before we get to the great David's greater son, let's spend a little time thinking of the coronation. For see, whenever there's a transfer of power and a new leader takes office, they have to make promises to act righteously in accordance with the law and their new appointment. These are such serious matters that we require them to swear on oath, or at least a solemn affirmation, usually on the Bible and usually in the name of God. For example, the inauguration of the presidents of the United States of America. That's a Republican coronation. No crown, that's the least they have, they're Republicans, but they take oaths on the Bible in much the same way. And it's done, you see, in the name of God. Actual coronations don't feature much within the Bible, for the crown is not so much the sign of appointment in the Bible as the anointing with oil. The king was the Lord's anointed, Messiah in Hebrew, Christ in Greek. We must never hear of Christ without thinking of the anointed king. The Christian heritage in Britain means that the coronation in the United Kingdom involves the appointment of the king by God symbolised in the anointing with oil. Now there are two common, very common errors that are frequently expressed about the monarchy in Britain. And so that we have a coronation that is actually a reflection of the Bible modelled up, muddled up with British pride, pomp, militarism, materialism and, and media. I'm going to tell you the two errors. One error, the Old Testament Israel is the kingdom of God is Britain. Britain is the kingdom of God. And so the king is the Messiah. Another error is there's nothing to learn from Israel's kingship laws. They're the opposite end of the spectrum. You see, one love the king, they think he's godlike. The other hate the king and think there's nothing to be learnt from Old Testament Israel. But Old Testament Israel doesn't really equal the kingdom of God and is not Britain. You can't just jump from the Old Testament to Britain. And likewise, there is everything you can learn from Israel's king's law. The whole idea of the rule of law, the whole idea of being answerable to the law, the whole idea of the nations learning what justice meant from the people of Israel, there's much to learn. So here are some elements to learn from Israel's kingship. The king is anointed by God, even when he doesn't know it. 
All appointments and authorities come from God. We can pray to God about them. Secondly, the king must live under the word of God. He needs to be given the word and read it. Read it. He needs to do the right thing and keep the word. He needs to know he is answerable to it. See, the king is not to be, the ruler is not just to follow the whims and fashions of the populace. Whatever the polls tells us, tells him to do. The king we want is the king who will do the right thing against the polls, if need be, or with the polls, if need be. But do that which is right. Thirdly, the king must swear on oath of his intention to govern according to the law. So help me God. He's, he's, he's invoking God to punish him if he fails to do so. And fourthly, we should be praying for the king. If you watch the coronation, you would have seen King Charles process into the cathedral in this kind of regal glory. He was already king, if you remember. He was coming for his coronation as king. But when the service got underway, the first thing that happened was the presentation of the Bible. And as it was given to him, it was said, Sir, to keep you ever mindful of the law and the gospel of God as the rule for the whole of life and government of Christian princes, receive this book, the most valuable thing that this world affords. Here is wisdom. This is the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God. The royal crown, the, the royal uh, jewels were there. The greatest collection of jewellery wealth possibly in the world was there. And this book is the most valuable thing that is ever there. Then with his hand on the Bible, he makes his undertakings, which include, amongst other things, you will, will you to the utmost of your power maintain the laws of God and the true profession of the gospel? Will you to your utmost of your powers maintain in the United Kingdom the Protestant Reformed religion established by law? And with his hand on the Bible, the king swore, the things which I have here before promised, I will perform and keep, so help me God. Only when he's confessed his faith and sworn to uphold it and the laws of the land is he ushered behind the screen to be anointed with oil as God's appointed king. The drama of the coronation service was the stripping off of all Charles's finery. He entered dressed as a king, but after the oaths and promises, he stripped of all his robes till in a very simple shirt, a very frail-looking, balding man, old man, entered in behind a curtain to meet with God. He doesn't enter into the presence of God dressed in the finery of wealth or in the symbols of power or in the uniforms of, of materialism or militarism, but in a simple shirt and a bare head to be anointed with oil and receive commission from God and once commissioned by God, the rest of the service, he's dressed again with an array of all the symbols of office and responsibility as he takes up the task of king. The simple way of understanding all this event, for many Australians find a really strange and weird thing was happening. Actually, it wasn't strange, it wasn't weird. Very simple way of understanding. Think of a wedding. So there we get dressed up in our finery and go to some amazing settings or buildings and with all our friends and family in their finery sitting in the appropriate place, we all stand as the bride processes in to particular music. And then words are spoken, promises are made, oaths are taken in the name of God and rings are given. It's the same kind of covenant ceremony more than a contract because it's making solemn promises, swearing oaths in the name of God to keep at all costs. And for Christians, we know that God is at work, for we declare God has joined together, let no man asunder. When I made my promises back in 1969, I plate my, thee my troth, I said to Helen. I don't know whether you did plight your troth, did you? <laughs> I plighted my troth. 
I'd ask people who plighted their trough to put their hands up, but we old folk can't manage that these days. <laughs> to plight is to promise at the risk of losing things. The trough is the truth, that is faithfulness, trustworthiness. That means to plight my trough, I pledge you my truthfulness. I will be true. At risk of all, I will be true. She gave me her trough, for she too was promising to be true. Well, now the modern services, you see, this is my solemn vow and promise. It's not wrong and simple and you can understand it. You don't need to have it explained to you. But it's pretty puerile in comparison to what I promised. I promised my truth. The wedding service, you see, with its oaths and promises, sets the scene for the rest of your life. Our unconditional oaths to God, promising each other a secure relationship within the bounds of, of till death us do part and a common understanding of what marriage is all spelled out for us. That's what a coronation is. Same thing, only it's with a king rather than with a husband and wife. It sets the scene for the rest of the king's reign, his unconditional oaths to God, promising his service to the nation. And so we then turn in prayer for the bride and groom. We turn in prayer for the king. And we respond to the whole appointment with applause and joyful singing and dancing. And the people all cried out, long live the king, long live the king, to a man who was already in his mid-70s. He's certainly not the king promised in the Old Testament. He's not the king who lives forever, for we know that's Jesus. David, he died and was buried with his father. Solomon, he died and was buried with his fathers. But Jesus, he died and God raised him up again to sit exalted at his right hand in all power and authority to reign forever as king of kings and lord of lords. See, throughout the coronation service uh, and in the sermon of the coronation, there was reference made to Mark 10, 45. Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. This is a very, very Christian understanding of kingship, promising to serve his people rather than be served by them. It's a wonderful concept derived directly from our Lord himself who humbled himself, although he was in the form of God, he didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, he took the form of a slave, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Sadly, the death on the cross was consistently omitted in the service and sermon. For the full verse reads, for even the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. But the full verse was not read. King Charles didn't promise to give his life for us, which is the basic promise of any Christian person in the cause of the gospel. It's the basic promise of any Christian husband, of any minister of the gospel, of any Christian person. I mean, it's wonderful that Charles will serve the people of the nation. But in our Christian service of Christ, we've got to do a lot more than that. We've got to follow Christ's example in our service of others. We must lose our lives for their sake, for Christ's sake, for the gospel's sake. But of course, Charles couldn't give his life as a ransom for us any more than we could give our lives as a ransom for others. None of us can do that because none of us are sinless. Only Christ could pay the price for another. Only Jesus was the one without sin who could become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Yet by omitting reference to this atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the example of Christ is vitiated and evicted. It's emptied of its power to save and it's emptied of its power to transform. See the contrasts of weddings between human sinfulness and the true husband. The contrast between the modern shacking up together 
and the solemn taking of oaths to be true to each other. Philippians reminds us that it was because our king was obedient to his divine appointment, obedient to the point of death, therefore, see that very first word, that very next word, therefore, it was because of the atoning death of Jesus, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so the name of Jesus. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess in heaven and earth and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's because of the atoning death of Jesus that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. Because this king laid down his life as a ransom, he's the one we can trust like no other forever. He's the one we will trust like no other and forever. He's the one we do trust with all power, with all authority over all of my life. Okay, open our Bibles. The longest introduction you've ever had to a Bible passage. (laughs) Romans chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. Rosie's already read one verse for us. Read it again, please, Rosie. Verse 11 of chapter 4. The kings cast their crowns before the creator, saying... No. That's not it? Oh, yes, that'll do. Yes, go on. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. See, God is the absolute monarch. There's chapter 4, verse 11, who's created all things. But now in chapter 5, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Christ, the root of David, appears. He comes as a slaughtered lamb standing in resurrection and then they break into a new song look down there verse 9 worthy you to take the scroll and to open its seals he says and you and you have take the seals sorry yes for you were slain and by your blood you ransom people from god for ransom people for god from every tribe language people and nation and you have made them a kingdom of, and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. And then verse 12, you see, all heaven breaks forth in verse 12. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honour and glory and blessing. See, the lamb deserves that. You can trust the lamb with that. You can't trust the king. You can't trust the prime minister. There's no point changing and trusting a president. There's no point trusting any human being to have such authority over you. But the one who died for you, who has been raised by God to sit at the right hand, the one who became sin so that you might become the righteousness of God, the one who is obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, And all heaven, verse 13, all every creature in heaven on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that, what are they going to say? To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honour and glory and might forever and ever. This is the king we can trust. This is the king we can want. This is the king who does live forever and we want him to live forever. This is the king we want to have as our king forever and ever. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy are you of all power, all authority, for all time. This is the King that's worth singing loud and clear. Long live the King. He will, but we want him to, because he's our King who laid down his life for us. Long live that King.